You want to know what gets me like hype in the morning, hype about my day? What, Dr. Smith? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I really love a good song. Right, I really love a good song. Now, I'm not going to play a song for you because we don't have time for that. But I do love a good song. So, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of like a hip-hop head. And so what I love is when someone takes, like, a favorite song of mine and then they kind of redo it. They put a new beat under it. Does anyone know what that's called? So when they put a new beat under a song that already exists. So there's one mix, but then there's now a... Remix. Everybody, so now we're going to take, I'm going to take you to, to my roots in uh, the black church in Atlanta. I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. say remix. remix, the format. The format. Remix. remix, the format. The format. And while you're in the sharing mood, say lift, lift. Up. up youth. youth. I'm glad you encouraged me to do that. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so, all right, for panel three which is titled, I wrote it, so I should know it, but I'm gonna read it just in case. Youth Political Engagement and Activism. So I'm excited about our panelists today. I'm going to quickly, so the whole remix the format thing, the reason why I brought that up is because we are remixing the format. So in this panel, there will be a time for Q&A. Really, we will be asking you questions and you will be giving us answers and thoughts and reflections in the middle of the session. Isn't that exciting? So we're remixing the format. So turn your neighbor and say, remix. Remix. The format. The format. Right. Good. Y'all are on it. So here are some of the voices that you're going to be hearing. You're going to be hearing from Nathaniel McLean Nichols. Nate, as we are calling him today. Is that okay if we call you Nate? It's all right, it's good, I got the thumbs up. Was proudly raised by a single mother along with his two sisters and two foster siblings in Boston, Massachusetts. He's 20 years old, he's a junior at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's worked as a youth organizer and associate program coordinator at the Center for Teen Empowerment for the past year. He strongly believes in cultivating youth voice, especially in communities of color. He has witnessed how their voices have been suppressed and lack support for development and growth. Nate aspires to be a middle school teacher and increase needed representation of males of color in education. Um, so you'll be hearing from his voice next. You'll also hear from Carrie Mays. She's also a youth organi organizer with the Center for Teen Empowerment. She's 16 years old. She's a junior at Fenway High School in Boston, Massachusetts. She's worked this, with the Center for Teen Empowerment for three years. She's passionate about promoting youth leadership and voice, especially of those traditionally underrepresented. Underrepresented. Here, Carrie helps become an entrepreneur and develop community programs. Carrie is also a singer. Note that. She's a singer, dancer, and actress. And then finally, we have a, a colleague and close friend of mine, Dr. Alon Hope. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at North Carolina State University, and she's a director of the Hope Lab. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she and her team, some of her team members are here, uh, take an assets-based approach to investigate factors that promote well-being for marginalized adolescents and emerging adults who face racism and racial discrimination. So she's going to share a little bit of her research. The next voice you will hear is from Nate. Cool. When I was little, I always wanted to go outside. And my mom, she tried to tell me that it wasn't safe for me. Right? Stay inside, baby. I think it'll rain shortly. And that water never fell, but then bullets sprayed shortly. And I learned quick, those are not fireworks in the daytime. You try and go and see them and your body might fall. So. Be careful where you step whenever it's nightfall, because even the night falls to metal that strikes small. And I was young, so I guess I couldn't handle it. <laughs> but I'm older now, and still, I can't handle it. But my age does not take away the power of my voice. And if you listen, when I speak, understanding's not a choice. It's clear that my experience is just as valid as yours is, because I lived mine and you lived yours, is it not, you know, kind of disrespectful in a way, to look at my age as a hindrance to me. Because at least to me, it seems like that would be judging me without knowing me first. <laughs> and my skin, ah, oh, man, let's get into it, I guess. My skin 
It's just an added layer of prejudice I face because my race is not the only hindrance I face. I guess when I was below 18, it seemed that I had nothing to say, no matter how loud I shouted and screamed, but I'm 20 now. I don't say too much, and I feel like my voice is getting heard more and more every single day. Why? Why does it have to be that way? Here's what I want you guys to take away. Please do not listen for the age that an individual has been alive and around on this planet. I repeat, please do not listen for the number of years someone has been alive on this planet. Because the youth, the youth are something so special, something so special. And our voices will not be banished. Thank you. That was dope, right? Yeah. So that was dope. Um, so like I was introduced as earlier, I am Nate. Um, right now, I'm 20 years old. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I work uh, with the Center for Teen Empowerment as an associate program coordinator. Um, in my past with TE, for the past year, I've worked um, as a youth organizer, um, as a community engagement organizer, kind of working within my community to uh, go beyond uh, what the role of a youth organizer would be, which is literally to organize a community. Uh, that would be my role as a community engagement organizer in that capacity. But I also worked as an artist manager, uh, which is super dope because with, uh, I think Young mentioned it earlier, that was super early in the day. So if you don't remember, it's cool. But Teen Empowerment also has a sector of it, which is called T Studios. And what we do is we work with young artists in the Boston area to kind of cultivate that artistic side of them and utilize that side of them to inspire and ignite social justice within our communities. I think that's dope. So that was like a spoken word piece that I did. Um, I worked, like I said, as an artist manager and I managed uh, two rappers. It was super dope doing that. They were really talented and I had a lot of fun doing that. But the work that we do at Teen Empowerment is very important to me because like I said earlier, this idea of like youth leadership and, and youth empowerment is something that is kind of like slept on in our communities. Usually it's not the voices of the youth that are like, jumping out to people. People don't necessarily want to hear what the youth have to say. And so this is why the work is important to me. Because as was mentioned earlier, I would like to become a teacher uh, for middle school, high school students. Because I feel like that's the age where students kind of feel the most, like they start to learn more about themselves and then they learn that they are more marginalized than other groups that they might be peers with. Um, or they might have peers from within other groups. And so when I was younger, I used to uh, attend a charter school. And so, not, like nothing against charter schools or anything, but in the school that I attended, it seemed like those that were in my school were usually uh, getting sent out of school because they had uh, you know, the wrong color sweater, or they weren't wearing a belt one day, and so they got sent home, or they you know, spoke their mind uh, at an incorrect time, and they kind of just got you know, pushed aside by the teacher. Um, and I guess in those situations, it's very important that youth are not getting pushed aside, especially not when it comes to being in school. Because at that point, it's like, you don't necessarily know what someone else's life uh, is gonna be like. You don't know what they have going on at home. You don't know what type of support system they have in play. So when it comes to being in school, that's a place that they spend a lot of their time. And when youth are in school and they're being ignored and neglected and pushed to the side, it definitely will destimulate any type of cultivation that might be, that might have taken place or that might, they might have going on. I think that really sucks. It's like something that needs to be prevented. And so I had a teacher. Uh, he was a math teacher. I don't really like math. So I didn't really like him off rip. But he was a very disrespectful teacher. He used to just talk to the students as if they were nothing and just like be really like disrespectful to them. And it seemed to me that he didn't really appreciate like the power that youth had. Because without us, really, he wouldn't have a job because he's a teacher. So it seemed like that was something that was an issue. And I don't want to have, I don't want to see any other student go through something that I had to go through like that because it seemed that it was super deleterious, not only to me, but to my peers as well. And so my goal uh, through my work is to be able to inspire youth to not only utilize their voices, but to understand and recognize that their voices have power and that they are real agents of change. 
not just in their communities, but worldwide. Because honestly, if we look at history, um, like my friend Maria said earlier, like it's the youth that have been inspiring change. Um, and in my spoken word, I touched a little bit about you know race, and we just got through watching that video on erasure, and it's like all these different factors of prejudice and marginalization come into play when it comes to anything. And I think that just like these added layers really are able to hinder young people from being able to find their voices. And one thing that I want to do is make sure that young people do have those voices. They are able to inspire other youth because at the end of the day, it's youth listen to youth more than they listen to adults because it can become kind of patronizing at times. I'm not going to lie. But that's all for me for now. Uh, and I think pass it off to Carrie. So thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So hello, beautiful people. My name is Carrie Mays. Um, I'm 16 years old, and I'm proud to say that I'm a youth organizer at Teen Empowerment. Um, I've been doing this work with Teen Empowerment of being a positive social justice warrior for going on to three years. Um, but I want to say that I didn't have Teen Empowerment my whole entire life. Um, I specifically grew up around um, the suburbs around Boston and where I was usually the only black kid in class. And usually being the only black kid in class, that perpetuated a lot of discrimination from my peers and even my teachers. Um, and that caused me to silence myself. I was told a lot to stay in your place, stay in a child's place, don't talk about the elephant in the room, or more so, don't talk about the in in uh, equities that are happening to you. And that caused me to silence myself and internally oppress myself. So, um, and with that being said, when I turned 13, I came to Boston and I was excited. I'm like, I'm moving to a community where I'm gonna see people like me um, and more, you know, reflect off of an experience that I can share with. So when I went into the school systems in Boston, I was happy to see a lot of people like me, but at the same time, I noticed that being in those um, educational, being in that education, well, having that education in Boston was just as detrimental of the educational experience that I had in the suburbs because now I'm going into a community where I have to deal with systemic oppression from all areas. Um, and people, a lot of people thought because when I came from the suburbs, I was going to have a lot of advantages, opportunities. But in all reality, when I went into the um, BPS system, the Boston Public School System, it was just as detrimental because um, of the systematic oppression and the, the unnecessary disciplinary system in the school to prison pipeline. Um, and with that being said, I had no space to talk about it. I had no space to talk about just being another angry black woman. Um, and I, that's where I found teen empowerment when I was 14. Um, I feel like teen empowerment was a space where they promoted and totally emphasized youth voice and they actually help youth like me um, and a lot of other youth who deal with those issues on a daily basis channel their anger into positivity and into action. So um, a lot of the work that we do at Teen Empowerment, it's a youth and adult partnership and we utilize our powers together. Um, and we've done a lot of like police community relationship dialogues and we talk about the issues that we face in our um, communities and we turn those into solutions. So it's not just a room where we just talk and here's your problem, let's just talk about it. No, let's do something about it. And that's what I loved about Teen Empowerment. We had police community dialogues, we've had dialogues on racism, we've had, we've used the arts and we still do use the arts as an art, as a platform um, to talk about these issues. And even we talk about gentrification, youth leadership, mental health, education, everything that affects us on a daily basis. And we don't have those spaces a lot in society. We are often neglected. Um, so with saying that, I appreciate Teen Empowerment and the work that we do. And I feel like if there was more um, social activism, youth activism, um, places where people can talk and youth can talk in our society, in our education, even after education, everywhere we go, I think this world would be a better place. So, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. 
I am Dr. Alon Hope. Um, I got the doctor part. I thank my husband for the last name, the Hope. Um, and I am an assistant professor in applied social and community psychology at North Carolina State University. Uh, and this just is my introduction to you all, why I do this work. Um, I was them, right? I was a kid who had ideas and thoughts about why our system is not working for me and people who look like me, people who live where I live, people who are from where I'm from. And so now that's what I study. Um, I study youth, how they cope and respond to racism and racial discrimination, and particularly activism or a critical civic engagement as a way to adaptively cope to systems of oppression. Um, so without further ado, I'll leave it there. Happy to talk with any and everybody about what I do. Um, we will go into our first activity, uh, which Nate and Carrie will lead us in. Remix. Remix. The format. The format. Remix. The format. So, we're going to do an activity called Colombian Hypnosis. Sound good. <laughs> um, so essentially what we're going to be doing in this interactive is in a moment, uh, Carrie and I will ask you guys to split off into pairs in your room after, of course, standing up and tucking in your chairs. But not right now. Don't worry about it too much. Um, and essentially the objective of this game is to simulate this idea of being a leader and another person being a follower. Right. So in your pairs, one person will be a leader. Um, and their objective will be to move their hand around for the follower to follow. And the follower will move their body in correspondence with wherever the leader's hand goes. So I'm the leader, and I'll go something like this. So as you can see, I'm following wherever Carrie's hand goes. It's pretty straightforward. Cool? Um, so now you guys know how it will be. And don't worry. Um, the, in the pairs, each person will get an opportunity to be the leader and the follower so you can get your revenge. Um, so right now, what, what we need to do is um, tuck in the chairs and stand up and tuck in the chairs. And find a pair, somebody that you don't know. Use the room. There's a lot of space. It's dope. Looking good, looking good. Does everybody have a pair? Everybody has a pair? Who does not have a pair? So everyone has a pair. Well, wow, that's great. So choose your leader and choose your follower. And it's okay, take up the space in the room, make them jump over chairs. No, I'm just joking. Um, take up the space in the room and begin. <laughs> oh, you see, look at these people over there. <laughs> They're moving around. <laughs> oh, this is comedy. This is comedy gold, as you can see. There's just people moving all over the place. See, she gets it. She's like, all right, we're going all around the room at this point. Whoa. Oh, look at this lady. She's spinning around. <laughs> yeah, you're running around in like straight circles. I know. Look at the wall over here. Jumping. <laughs> oh, look at, look at. See, they're coming, they're coming towards us. I'm like, all right, I'm going to follow too. Oh. Okay, 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 stop. Stop. That was comedy, honestly. Um, that was pretty good. So now, whoever was just the leader will be the follower, and whoever was the follower will be the leader. Now, begin. Look, good. Look, good. <laughs> And you, like, it really looked like they were all, like, in, like, a puddle doing the same thing, yeah. like, the same motion. That's crazy. That's crazy over there. They're over here, dude. I didn't even know that they were doing it behind us. Like. 
Wow. That's All right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> oh, we're going to go to All right, guys. Do we need the presentation? You know, I don't want to hold you too much. <laughs> Ooh, that looked like one. I mean, I am get to partake but it definitely looked like an enjoyable experience cool so now that you guys are settling back into your seats um, or already have settled for most of you which is dope um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you guys a few questions but first I want to thank you guys for first of all just participating in that interactive stepping outside of your comfort zone doing all that I thought that was dope um, but the first question I want to ask you guys is what exactly does this interactive demonstrate about leadership it's a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to take you back there. And okay. I'm thinking that um, leadership and following is kind of reciprocal. Um, so there might, may be times where you are the leader and other times where you have to do more following. And so it kind of, to me, challenges our ideas about, like, who can be a leader if it's fixed or not, you know? The roles are kind of interchangeable depending on like the situation. Nice. Thank you. We have somebody all the way back there. I see you. They're on their way to you. <laughs> Trust the process. Um, I noticed that uh, in that relationship you need cooperation for it to work, so it's not just about the leader empowered and saying things, but you also need to have the other person engage and cooperating okay, with gotcha. you if you want it to work. Nice, thank nice. you. And then we had, were you raising your hand? Yes. Okay. Hi, um, it just made me sort of think about the importance of like positionality and power and being aware of the power that you have. Because when I was the leader, it was fine. I did sort of ask him a couple of times if it was okay if I did something because that's just who I am as a human. Um, but then I found when I was on the receiving end um, how easy it could be to be uncomfortable with just having to like blindly follow and um, just have my body sort of being controlled. And so it was just interesting, like, you know, it just makes you think about the idea that you always have to be aware that even though you're not feeling your position or your power, that it really does impact other people. Nice. And then, do you want to go? That's sort of what I was going to say. Great minds think alike. Yes. As a person who's probably the oldest person in the room at age 80, I was glad to have one of the younger people, I don't know if you're the youngest, and to have this equalization of um, power, who's demonstrating what to whom kind of uh, sense, which we don't always get. Awesome. Well, before we go on, um, Nate has another question to ask, so you'll have more of a chance to talk. And this one is a little more related to like your experience with the game or with the interactive, so hopefully uh, it'll like stimulate a little bit more conversation. I'm like I'm lonely up here. I really want to hear you guys' voices. You know, it kind of sucks just like talking. But the second question that I do have for you guys um, is, as far as like this, the different roles, right? The role of a leader and the role of a follower, like. How did those roles feel to each of you? Because each of you did uh, partake in both roles, so I assume you have you know, some feelings about one role or the other. Um, so I'd just like to know a little bit about how you felt in each of those roles, the, leader of a, I mean, the role of a leader and the role of a follower. Raise your hand. Yeah. Then, yeah. Sound good. Um, I really didn't, like when it came to the leader role, I was like, really didn't know what to do. So that's what um, I was thinking about because like when you're a leader, like people think you know everything and you don't, like sometimes you need help. 
sometimes you need help from others. So when I was doing it, I just like, I don't know what to do. And that's what, that's what leaders deal with on a daily basis. So, yeah. Anybody else? I found that as I was leading, I wanted to be mindful of the person who was following and not asking him to do anything that would make him uncomfortable or look awkward or um, so, you know, be mindful of and perhaps it's because I knew I was going to have to be in the position at some point, too, but <laughs> respectful of the person that was was leading. One last comment for this question. Um, I had fun in both, right? So I had I enjoyed leading, and I was like, "Oh, what can I do? Where can where can we go in the space? Like, what can my hand do? Like, how what do I what power am I wielding?" And then it made me worry, like, "Uh oh, what power <laughs> will will Dr. Smith will Chauncey wield when it's his turn?" But then I also had fun, but there was some nervousness, like, "Okay." We're on a stage. I'm gonna have to jump off, and, you know. But it was. But I also then had fun and was able to follow. So that sometimes trepidation with leading, but also trepidation with following. Well, so um, I have another question to hit you guys with. Um, when it comes to society, what role do you see youth more taking? The ones being led or the ones leading, and why? So I saw her hand, and then we'll get to you. I would like to see. Is this thing on? I would like to see the youth leading, right? Because, like I said in my presentation, it's too late for me, right? You guys are going to inherit this world. So, really, I need to support you all in, in leading and be a good follower. I, um, I like that question, and I like your activity. I, I would say that um, I really support youth leadership, and I, I appreciate youth leadership. And I also think we have to be careful about romanticizing youth leadership, because if we want to be thoughtful about um, you know, recognizing the humanity in everybody, young people should have a powerful voice at a table that should also include other people. Um, you know, in the same way that like the 80 year old in the room, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot again, but um, <laughs> is like, you know, that person can also be marginalized. Um, and, uh, and I think, so I think, I think the role that I envision for, that, that I envision would be useful to think about for young people is like, we have had a dearth of youth leader, of, of recognizing youth leadership and privileging youth leadership for a long time. So we do have some work to make that up. And so maybe that means that we put young people, we, we uplift the voices of young people, and we should, because young people are amazing and creative and awesome. Um, and also, I don't think we want to forget that there's, there's benefit in different kinds of experiences and different places that people are positioned in society. And so, um, we have to do that in a way that doesn't rob young people of the benefit of other people's ex life experiences, too. So I saw uh, her hand in the black blazer. I just want to keep a speaking order. So for, I'll oh. go black blazer, and then oh. get out. <laughs> I forgot what I was wearing. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it as an either-or question. Um, I think that... You know, there's this phrase, something like, you know, we need the, the energy and creativity of young people with the wisdom of the elders. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of intergenerational leadership, but it's a lot harder than, than it is. Um, when I was a teenager, I knew everything, and I didn't want to listen to anybody. Um, so why should teenagers be any different? So finding that balance and be able, being able to create those partnerships, and there's a tendency for adults to want to take over, because, well, India, you know, like, you'll, you'll understand this 10 years from now. Um, so then like, I squash her leadership, but I really do think it's, it's trying to find that, that mix. And, and sometimes it changes. Sometimes the youth will be leading, sometimes they'll be a little bit behind, so it's, it's a constant negotiation. I find that um, the role of the power structures in society is something that we need to put in the room when we're talking about trying to find the balance. 
I think it's easy to find a balance. I think it's difficult to maintain the balance. And so we've got both sides. I think in, in some instances, the older, the elders need to, to make way for the youth to find their voices. And I think that we can't have that conversation without acknowledging the power structures that are in the room, and sometimes they're transparent. And we, we, we hit our heads on it constantly, and, and we wonder what's going on. And, and it's kind of like that narrative of stay in your place until we call you, until we're ready to hear your voice. And sometimes it's very difficult to sit back. So that's all. But I think it's, again, the notion of the balance is important and who are, the, who are the players and how do we maintain the balance is where the real work is because it's very difficult to give up of yourself to, for others to have that space. You guys are doing a great job, by the way. Uh, so I saw a lot of hands uh, go up. Well, I'm definitely going to take you next um, and then I will probably be able to take like two more comments. Uh, related to this question. There's another question, so I don't worry yeah. too much about it. But uh, so definitely uh, you can go ahead. And then I saw a hand back here, uh, so I can go you. And then did you have a hand? Okay. All right. I guess just following up on the on the on the structures. I I, I come from South Africa, and I'm going to talk about um, the international kind of uh, dynamics to mm -hmm. to youth. But um, I really think that. Um, in that context, at least, uh, youth don't have as much institutional power. But outside of institutions, youth are doing a lot of work. And recognizing that those, the, in, the, the institutions and the non-institutional spaces are not mutually exclusive, they, there is a lot of interaction that happens. But I think because youth, for the most part, uh, lack institutional uh, power, they, it, it is a lot harder for them to influence um, systemic issues at, at, a, at an institutional level because they have to at least uh, uh, dev devise mechanisms that have to be acknowledged at, a, mm -hmm. at an institutional level. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to say the last two comments. I saw you in the black sweater and then you in the red. Hi, thank you. I think my answer is both and. I think that there's a space for young people to be in an environment where they're growing their leadership alongside adults and youth adult partnerships and where you might see adults leading a little bit more in the beginning, but when we're doing it well, we're really in the sphere where young people are taking the lead, but there's a space to build that leadership, to build into that leadership, and then we can move into service learning, community service, and really when we're doing it well into community development. So for me, it's a both and. And I think that when you have great leadership, you produce more leaders in and of itself. Thank you. And then last comment for this question would be, Frank. And the, yep, you got it. As well, thank you. Um, for me, it's like, are young people leading to change the systems that are here to oppress us? I'll say no. <laughs> It's like, since we are socialized to follow and just listen to the adult in the room, since from a young age we've just been socialized, hey, if a parent is talking to you, and it's my experience, it's like, I have to listen to what my father is saying. And so as I go into like, the education system, if I go into like, a hospital, everywhere I go into other institutions, I have to listen to the person in charge. So I don't see young people confronting that issue. And how do we even socialize kids? How do we start changing the way we socialize our youth in a way that question society and questions the system they are there to, to me personally, is to oppress us. So I don't see young people in that front line changing those systems in a way that's very effective. Mm -hmm. I feel like youth are leading at the local level with small social rights and when it comes to the big contacts of like the master's house, I just don't see young people there. Or even adults, anywhere. So we just socialize to follow that same system as it is and just keep on reinforcing and building upon that system itself. That's my view. I think young people are not leading. Yep. All right, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one last question to ask, and we're going to take less comments because that was a lot of comments for that question. Um, so the last question is, do youth have to be given the power to lead, or do they have? So we heard about earlier how um, 
youth kind of like created this sense of power by walking out and protesting. And then we heard about how they had kind of like some power in the policies and, you know, picking the commissioner for, for their um, city. So do youth have to be given the power to lead or do they have to create that power themselves? We're gonna go uh, you back here, and then I see another hand in the black all the way back here, and then go to you. And those would be the three comments that we take. Cool. Okay, so I think like I'll expand on this later during the call to action, but I think um, that when you are given a seat at the table, you can also simultaneously create your own table, and when doing so, that table that you create can work as like in a partnership with the person who's at the bigger table, and that person at the bigger table can work as a liaison. So in terms of like age, who at whatever youth is given like a seat at that table, they can work with other youth to then empower each other to make their own like youth movement. Thank you. And then back here, uh, our friend in the so I, I agree. I think uh, for sure that both need to happen. So young people have the autonomy and are powerful in terms of organizing and have been historically, right? So you talked about the, the Black Panthers. We talked about Fred Hampton, who was 19 years old when he was leading or when he became, you know, helped found the, the Black Panther Party in Chicago, you know? So, and I, I can even reflect on myself, you know, as a young person, when I didn't see something in my school, I developed the organization to have these conversations about issues. But at the same time, there has to be strategic things placed to get give young people voices but in ways that they have been marginalized. So for instance, on a board of education, having a student representative matters, and that person has voting power. It's different than having kind of instrumental power and being able to talk about things than having the actual ability to enact policy changes. Yeah. All right, thank you. And then there was a, a woman in the black. Well, I don't know if I really have much to add now that these two brilliant women just spoke, but um, I was just going to say, I mean, youth is not a stagnant group. Um, we're all always changing, like we've all been youth or are currently and will no longer be at some point. So to me, it's, it's more about exactly what she said. It's sort of, are we making structures so that all age groups can sort of be at the table? Um, and do we at different ages come to the table and bring those voices forward? That was just what I was thinking about. Hi. Um, I think it's a, it, it's of course yet another both and situation. Um, no matter what structures exist, um, no matter if we create them or not, Youth will find a way to lead. I mean, we can, we can take out, right, kind of this, the black and white pictures of people, people with berets on or fists in the air or with suits on or whatever. We can just go to Twitter. We can go to Instagram. Youth are leading now. And they're facilitating change right now at this very moment. And it's not always good change. Sometimes it's really great change. Sometimes it's, uh, oh, wow, OK. Hey. Um, and then sometimes it's, um, Sometimes it's problematic change, sometimes it's great. I think it is important for us to listen. No matter what structures we put in place, youth are always going to push us. They're always going to tell us, you're not doing it right. Youth are innovators. Any youth and social innovation folks in the room? Hey, right? Youth are innovators, right? So they're always going to find way. They're always going to see a wall that doesn't make sense, a door that doesn't even need to be on hinges. And so it's on us to not only create spaces within our existing kind of rigid structures, but also to be willing and ready to knock walls down when you say, that ain't working, right? That's not going to do nothing. I, I don't need that wall there, or I need this here. I, so I think we have to be a little bit more mobile um, when it comes to bringing youth to the table. So facilitating them into our structures um, and hearing their voices from that way, but also understanding the ways in which they, the, the ways in which they see beyond the walls, right? All right, thanks. Great. Dope, everybody. So yeah, I just wanna, again, thank you guys for being able to participate in that interaction, answer those questions so thoughtfully and thoroughly. Um, it's really a testament to the you know, passion and energy that's in the room when it comes to youth involvement and engagement. Um, so I think that for now, one thing that we want to focus on um, in terms of this interactive is how much it focuses on power, you know, and how much, you know, this impact of power has on each individual within the communities and, this and, and within this dynamic of power where the youth uh, fit in. 
and like what their role is in terms of like power. Yeah, and it's necessary. It's obviously um, seen throughout all these conversations and the discussion that we just had that youth activism is necessary and needed in our society and especially in our country and in our world. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize the significance of adults and youth working together and also adults helping them, giving them that opportunity to make those solutions a real. Mm -hmm. So um, right now I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Hope who will now talk more about activism and how your individual impact can um, change that. Aren't these youth amazing in their ability to facilitate a large discussion? I don't like following this, um, but here I stand. And I'm gonna talk to you all about risk in activism and how we might think about and consider supporting youth activism in this idea of spectrum of risk. Part of my research, I'm a psychologist, so part of what I want to know is, Okay, and I'm a community psychologist, right? So we're all about social change. It's, we, we think there is a right and a wrong, right? Like some things are not correct and need to be addressed. Um, but there's also our well-being, ourselves, who are we? And how is engaging in activism impacting who we are? What are the risks and what are the rewards? Nope. <laughs> okay. It's a different slide. Yeah. <laughs> this also sounds interesting, I, uh, but it's, it's not my work. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess I'll just talk a little bit about some of the stuff. I, have, I also have an activity. You won't have to get up. Um, but you will just need a sheet of paper and just something to jot down with, or even your phone will work. Um, We'll actually do a little survey of our, we'll do, take a little questionnaire about our risk um, orientation with regard to activism. But part of what in my work I've found and looked at is we think about black and Latino college students. That's a big project I was working on um, who may be involved in activism or civic engagement. What happens under conditions of discrimination? So for those who've experienced a lot of microaggressions, what's the mental health response when you're engaged also in a lot of activism? And we found some, what I think are interesting findings, where for the black students, um, stress and anxiety were higher for the students who experienced more microaggressions and were actually very involved in activism. So um, there was actually a protective mental health benefit to being less involved if you're experiencing a lot of microaggressions. But if you're not experiencing a lot of microaggressions, then being involved was more protective. You experienced less stress. But for our Latinx students, it was the reverse. So for stress and anxiety, if you were more involved under more experience of microaggressions, you actually had less stress and less anxiety. Um, and this was kind of, this research grew out of this idea of, all right, we talk about the benefits to the system of this work, but what might be some of the detriments to the individual when we talk about engaging in discourse and we talk about um, being patient and maybe being angry and, right, we talk about all of these things we might experience and pushing against the status quo. Um, it's one of my biggest kind of pet peeves is the burden's always on the oppressed, right? We have to engage in the discourse and let people have their beliefs that I'm not an equal human being and <laughs> work with that. Um, but it comes at a detriment to my mental health and well-being. Um, and so I'm hoping to do more work to dig deeper into why, right? Why for some groups um, microaggressions weren't as negatively impactful when coupled with activism than they were for other groups of people. And then thinking about systems of oppression, so like understanding systems of oppression, what role does that play as well? So part of that work also led me to go, okay, but all activism isn't created equal. Some is a little more risky than, than other types. Um, and so I found this scale that I'm also kind of looking at expanding and, and revisiting. And so we'll, we'll, we'll ask the question of ourselves today, what kind of activist are we? Okay, 
So it's, we, I, I slim down the scale, zero, one, or two. So zero, this is extremely unlikely. I'm not doing this. No, not never. Um, one, it maybe. Or two, always. This is, this is me. I'm doing this. This is, this is what I'm doing. So how likely are you? So you can jot down, it's just going to be five questions for high risk and five questions for low risk. You can jot down what kind of activist are you? How likely are you to purchase a poster, bumper sticker, or t-shirt that endorses a political point of view? I'm a two, hence my t-shirt. <laughs> right, the personal is political in this case. How likely are you to go out of your way to collect information on a social or political issue? How likely are you to present facts to contest another person's social or political statement? And how likely are you to boycott a product for political reasons? And then sign a petition for a political cause. So we have five statements, so you can be from zero to 10, right, on low-risk activism. So just kind of a show of hands, how many low-risk activists do we have? Like eight, nine, 10. These are my things. How many kind of in the mid-range? Four, five, six, seven. And then, nope, not doing any of these things. Okay, so we're always moderate to high, low-risk activism. So let's think about high risk. So high risk are things that you more likely might cause you bodily harm or some, some sort of retribution to your person or your belongings or things like that. So same scale, sorry I didn't show up. Zero, not, I'm not doing it. One, maybe, depends on the day, the cause, the time. Or two, that's I'm doing it. How likely are you to engage in a physical confrontation at a political rally? I hear the murmurs already. I'm gonna just be a zero. I already know Dr. Hope, it's all right. Uh, engage in a political activity in which you feared some of your possessions would be damaged. Engage in a political activity in which you knew you would be arrested. So if you've said, if I was back in the 60s, I would march with King, check your answer on this one. Engage in a legal act as part of a political protest. And this is bad, technically bad science. I'm like interpreting the questions while you're answering them. <laughs> or block access to a building or public area with your body. So are you sitting in the president's office to demand curriculum reform at the university? Maybe? <laughs> okay, so, I'm wondering, oh, there's my scale. <laughs> okay, so let's add these up, right? So five items, so zero to 10. And how many high-risk activists do we have? Uh, like eight to 10 range. Seven, so some borderline? Okay, so like that mid-range, like four to seven. Okay, how many, nope. I'm with you on the bumper stickers, and I'll sign your petition. Okay, all right. So we see they're varied, right? So between, okay, between low risk and high risk, there was different orientations towards what we might do for a particular cause. Um, and my thinking towards this and where I hope to move the field is also, I'm willing to bet this would vary depending on what the cause was, right? That for me personally, I'm very invested in anti-racism towards black people. And you can catch me maybe being a little more high risk for this cause. Um, I think about 
a die-in that happened during my postdoc where I was pregnant. And I said, am I going to do the die-in pregnant? And I said, I'll do the die-in pregnant. But then they went to block an intersection. I said, I can't block the intersection. That's a risk I'm not willing to take for this cause. Had it been another cause, I might not have been willing to take any of those risks, right? Um, and so I wanted to talk to, this, talk to you all about this, particularly in terms of how to support youth and thinking about the risks and how to mitigate those risks and also provide access to the reconciliation and interpersonal healing that may need to take place despite the risks. Um, we think about youth, there might be risk of retribution, right? If I speak out in school, what are my risks of suspension or expulsion or teachers that will no longer write me positive recommendations, right? What are my long-term risks? What are my risks of arrest? Or what are my risks of bodily harm? What risks are our youth taking? And how can we um, help mitigate that? And honestly, I don't have those particular answers, but that's the question I pose today. And that idea that um, there's leaders and followers, but part of that leading in terms of space and place and opportunity for youth activism is also helping with like risk management. What um, can we do? And also for the longevity of it, right? We wanna keep this going and you can't go empty. You have to go full. Um, yeah. So I think at this point, we'll have a little time for questions. Yep, we have time. Okay. So yeah, I think at this point we'll open it up broadly for questions to the whole panel and even ideas from you all. What has worked in terms of, of the risk, right? Psychological, physical risks with the youth that you work with. Yes. And I'm gonna sit so we can all talk. Hi. All righty. I have a friend in the back. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so I'm Armenian, and a lot of us, what we do is we try to get um, genocide recognition from the Turkish government. So I, every year, April 24th, I am protesting um, at the Turkish embassy trying to get some form of recognition. But I see such an ugly side in humans when I see these protests. People are so degrading towards each other. The way that they interact on, the, on opposing sides, I find to be such, the, some of the lowest forms of behavior is seen throughout these protests. My question that I wanted to pose is, do you think there's a different way we can go about getting systemic change without having to go to such regards in terms of how we interact with each other? Because I've gone to protest after protest every year, trying to seek out the same thing, but absolutely no change is being had. Instead, at those protests, what we see are just two sides with two, like such opposing beliefs, trying, and with that, we are trying to get some resolution, but absolutely no resolution is had because of how much hatred is had on both sides. So how can we go about fixing or innovating a different way of protesting to get the same solutions we want without having to see such low forms of um, behavior on both sides of the coin? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, one thing that I'm hearing from you is like this idea of like, you know, dehumanization, kind of like either side not really seeing the other side as, you know, valuable in their beliefs or um, their strategies. And I think that one way in terms of like systemic change, being able to bring that about is first to be able to like uh, recognize the power that each side holds from whatever side you're on. Um, and so, that's a very difficult thing to do. Oftentimes, because when you're so like staunch and firm in your beliefs, it's like difficult to see any like uh, merit that the other side may hold. And I think that, um, yeah, like I was saying, one of the first steps in order to like bring about systemic change is to understand the argument of the other side. And rather than attacking them uh, through like you know degrading them in any sense, degrade their points. Like make it so that they don't have any arguments. You know, because at some point it gets to the point where it's like it becomes easy uh, to kind of just like go back and forth and argue, but after a while, if your argument 
you know, becomes kind of like moot in this point, then it's like there's no argument to be had. And if the other side is like stronger than the other, and then uh, one side in terms of like their argument and the way they go about it as well, their presentation, then it's kind of just it's difficult to argue with them, you know. So that is a very like sensitive topic, um, and I think that uh, for it just kind of has to be like a, an understanding amongst like the entire or at least like a majority of the group that wants either side to make sure that they're looking at it as like you know something that they believe in. Sure, but something that they also want to go about very respectfully, regardless of how the other side is going about. I'm a very like, you know, passive person. But when it comes to like beliefs that I am like strong about, I don't want to like attack the other person, but I do want to make them believe in my point. And I think that that's one way of going about that. You guys. All right. So we have one more question. We have a couple more questions at the back. So right here. In the black shirt, raise your hand, nice and high. And that was a very difficult question about application to a specific problem. That's tough, and there's no, Elizabeth, hi, hey. Um, there's no um, one correct answer, and it's tough. So I think what's great about this space is there's a lot of wisdom, a, lot of, a wealth of wisdom in the room. And so I think hopefully people who have some thoughts, uh, some answers, some specific application things, if you could go and find Elizabeth, raise your hand. And uh, encourage my very bright student. All right, here we go. Hi, I just want to say I'm so encouraged to be here because these are conversations. I'm from New York. I'm situated at Cornell where um, we literally have these conversations behind closed doors. So I'm glad that there's a public forum for us to have these, these conversations. So how do we help with risk management and the longevity of it? Um, I think grounding our experiences in love um, and starting with that. So I always remind my students that we come from a place of love and just starting those experiences and checking in with people. Mm -hmm. Um, but also that self-care is real. And so how do we create spaces within our communities, within our schools, to really practice self-care uh, and to draw people in and to say, you know, you might be tired, so it might be time for you to follow or to take a break, and that those things are okay. That's all a part of the work. And then you're able to come back with a renewed sense of how you can do the work. So that looks like self-care packages. That looks like shea butter. That looks like, you know, vitamin D3 pills and, you know, lights for when things get kind of dark um, in upstate New York. But also, that looks like drawing people in and saying, hey, sister, you know, you don't have to carry this thing by yourself. And so I think creating those spaces within our communities where we can do self-care and healing, whether it be through a festival or holding healing retreats for families, um, that those things are all very necessary. But also, again, rooted in love. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to respond to that yes, as well yeah. because another thing that I neglected to mention earlier was that this idea of high risk and low risk activism, right? There's a lot of pieces, to, there's a lot of places to play. And it's okay to not be able to go to the protest. It's okay to say, I have to sit this one out um, for your overall self well-being as well. And to say, you know what, this is my space, this is my niche. Um, I kind of, when I saw the movie Selma about the, um, that particular march in, in um, the civil rights movement, I was thinking, you know, some people were back at the church to make sure when everybody got back from that march, they had food, they had rides home, right? Like Bandages. there's a lot of spaces in the different types of activism as well to, to, to play. And I also appreciate the source, right? Locating the source of your activism, right? Uh, there is some value to anger being the source of activism, but also centering love as the source of activism and thinking about how much farther uh, both can take us. Great. So, in the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right here, Omar. Is that you, Omar, in the back? Do you mind if I tell a little story? Because I think it speaks to everything we're talking about. Go for it. Um, so, this is a story of a, a pretty large youth development organization based in the South, Atlanta, um, that serves you know a few thousand young people, and decided to go down this venture of Youth Voice, right? Where we care about teens, we care about young people, and one of the ways we're going to do it is we're going to start this uh, uh, spoken word program for young people. We're going to bring in artists and pair uh, teenagers with spoken word artists so they can learn this form of self-expression. And this is an organization that serves mostly low-income young people of color that's uh, 
uh, that's a history of Atlanta, right? And um, it, it turned, you know, there's a showcase and it's a beautiful thing, young people getting up there on stage, speaking about things they're passionate about. And after a couple of times, as young people got more comfortable with it, they started tackling real topics, right? Topics that were real to them. We're talking about police brutality. We're talking about a legacy of slavery. We're talking about puberty and masturbation, right? Uh, but in ways that were very raw. This is an organization that's led by a very conservative, uh, southern white person, married to a Republican senator. That became a very uncomfortable moment, as you might imagine. And their immediate reaction is, we need to shut this down. This is unacceptable. We have funders here. We have people here. We can't be put, having young people speaking in this capacity mm -hmm. in our name. Mm -hmm. And it took about a year of a couple of things. The young people standing their ground. Of, and we had to attend to their mental health, too, because it's a shocking thing. It's a demoralizing thing to be told you what you're saying is invalid. But also them taking the time to educate about this is them speaking about their experience that over time was able to maintain this opportunity and make it a point of pride for the organization rather than a point of shame for the organization. So all this to say there's hope and there's possibilities for young people to really get through and for two sides to get through, but it takes a lot of work and pain, unfortunately. Sorry. No, thank you. All right. Um, any responses here? Any Amen. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, we have, I think we're going to do about two more. So I had some hands in the back, and I know I got you, Dr. Watts, up front. All right, right there in the white shirt. Um, hi. I, I just, this is touching on some of the earlier sessions today, too, in response to what you were just talking about in terms of risk management. And, you know, some of the earlier sessions when we were talking about civic education talking about this real critical space for talking across difference. Um, and to me, I was sitting here and thinking in kind of a worried way that yes, the educator in me loves that, but also recognizing that even speaking in those spaces is a risk for some people, that it's not born equally by all of us to be activists in those conversations. Um, and right now I'm specifically thinking about racial justice. These are not, issues, at least in my opinion, that are like balanced on two sides. Um, and so uh, using this kind of idea of risk management that you're bringing up, are there things that we should be thinking about as educators when we're crafting those spaces to make them safe, but also productive, but productive for everybody, like not productive in this like white people are going to learn about racism here. Um, because it seems like that's a, real, that's a real danger there. There's a real risk at play there um, that we have to be incredibly careful about as educators and also just thinking about civic education in a broader sense. So if you have any thoughts about that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I think the biggest thing that comes to mind is context, right? knowing your room and doing the work to say, okay, yes, having these conversations is a good idea, but what's the room? Who are the people most at risk for this conversation, right? It'll, be, it'll benefit some to have this conversation, but who's at risk? And what do I need to know before I start this conversation as the facilitator in the room? to help to, to mitigate that, right? So what do I need to know about the history of this community? What do I need to know about the history of different social identities that folks in the room might bring to bear? What do I need to know so that the burden isn't on them when those discussions happen? Um, and to me, that's responsible facilitating so that the student doesn't feel like they have to represent or the student doesn't feel like, well, my teacher has this particular view, so I can't express my view. Um, so that there can be that safe space for questions, but not at the risk of students being further discriminated against and further microaggressed, right? I shouldn't have to sit through your question to have to experience, I shouldn't have to experience trauma for your growth. Mm. Um, yeah. I didn't know that was going <laughs> to. Uh, tweet that, tweet that. Yes, I, I'll leave it there. That Hashtag youth act 17. <laughs> tweet that. Okay. Um, Dr. Watts. Uh, 
yeah, I just wanted to speak out for us low risk folks here. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important to think about risk issues, but it's also a matter of strategy. I mean, these are direct action, and that's only one of many ways you can contribute. Um, and with that in mind, I do suggest everyone read Sun Tzu's book. It's full text is available on site, on, online, free, a number, number of places. But the important thing is here is, for example, if you're trained in, in um, nonviolence and you believe in that, you wouldn't want to provoke a confrontation. So, so that's a strategy issue, not so much a risk issue, but a strategy issue. And um, so I think a couple of things to think about, what do we think is the best way we can, um, we can help? Is it through direct action? Is it through policy or whatever? And I'll leave you with one thing my friend said when back in the days when we were, uh, the, the universities were protesting apartheid, anti-apartheid, and, and, and students were camping out in shanty towns uh, uh, on universities, I was walking uh, down with a colleague of mine. He said, he said, you know, when I was young, I used to camp out. But you know what I do now? I write a check. <laughs> and, and that's important for us because students don't have any money, but they have bodies. A lot of us out here have money, and these organizations need money. So don't feel guilty about not sleeping there. Write a check. <laughs> Also, I think that it's important to ask why are they high, like usually the youth. Um, so recently, the mayor of Boston cut a lot of funding from our schools. Um, and also, the governor cut a lot of, specifically $100,000 from teen empowerment and a lot of other youth organizations. Um, but for, when it came to our educational system, there was a BPS walkout. And hundreds of thousands of students, including me, walked out of school in the middle of class. And the majority of my class didn't want to do it. There's a couple few who did it because they were, they were scared. They're like, my teachers don't support this. Um, my teachers are like, you can do it if you want. You can go speak if you want. But just know your grades are going to be lowered. Um, so those are a lot of risks that we take. But I feel like the reason why we take those risks is because sometimes when we scream, we are not listened to. So what do you do? You, you find it in the, you build the door to open. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And it was kind of um, disappointing when we went to City Hall and the door was closed on us again and the mayor would not come down to talk to us. So um, later on in the week, there was like a dialogue so that we can talk about it and we can actually not confront him, but um, have a conversation like why did you do this and actually have that communication and I feel like when it comes to being an activist communication is key and also knowing the purpose of why you're doing the work that you do and staying grounded in that um, and also like like she said like like Dr. Hope said we are me as a youth activist I am like all about love like people call me Care Bear and my name's Carrie so um, realizing why you're doing the work, staying grounded in that, and not to inflict the same pain on others that they've inflicted on you. <laughs> All right, you want to come up here? Mm -hmm. All right. Right there? Yeah. All right. So, like I said, Carrie is a singer. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave it at that. Like the river I've been running Ever since It's been a long A long time coming But I know A change gonna come Oh yes it will It's been too hard living And I'm afraid to die 
Cause I don't know what's up there, yeah Beyond the sky It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change gonna come Oh, yes it will I go to the movies And I go downtown But somebody keep on telling me Don't hang around It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change gonna come Oh, yes it will Listen up, listen up Then I go to my brother And I say, brother Help me please But he winds up Knocking me back down on my knees. Oh, 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 there have been times when I thought I would last for long, but now I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. You know what I like to get my day going? A song. Um, so, this concludes our panel. Would you please give our awesome panelists one more round?